morning. Oh, y'all are awake. Okay, so um, just to give you a little bit of a background, I'm a first generation farmer. Um, I was a career fireman for 12 years, a volunteer for 15. And like he said, I guess uh, somebody from Farm Credit was dumb enough to loan a 27 year old over a million and a half dollars to go into agriculture. Um, when we looked at farming, we started first out with 30 acres. Our first season, we had a good success with that. And I wanted to continue the farm and actually farm full time. So we've scaled up with acres. Since that time, we've been doing this for 11 years. Um, we run Regenerative Farmer Inc. That's our farm name. Um, I also partnered with Dr. Liz Haney with Soil Regen. We started a mobile milling uh, operation that's an enclosed trailer that the trailer travels from farm to farm. And we actually mill grains and package them for farmers to sell. And then everybody who was here last night, if you didn't make it here last night, you missed the, re the refreshments, but I brought some bourbon up that we make the first bourbon in North Carolina since Prohibition with Farmers Reserve Distillery. So let's talk a little bit about what is soil health? So what is soil health? Um, where do you start? You know, you grow stuff in dirt and we like to test soils. Um, I know I'm not from Minnesota, I'm really southeast Minnesota. Uh, you have to go about 1200 miles, but this is where you'll end up. Um, I farm in Catawba County, North Carolina. Um, we farm Lincoln County, Catawba County, and Iredale. Uh, so we're pretty spread out. We're at the base of the mountains, the foothills, so our west county ground is really steep slopes, pretty much you're farming the bottom of the hillsides, farming on contours. Once you start getting east of there, we start to flatten out into the Piedmont. Where I started out in agriculture and why I wanted to farm is, this is a picture of my grandpa Richard. Um, the man made hay on about 10, 15 acres. Um, I used to ride on the step board of a Ford tractor. My eyes would swell shut from hay fever and for some reason when he passed away, I just decided I wanted to farm and, and try to do some stuff. We made hay for one year and I realized that making square bales with no help was absolutely horrible. Um, this is my actually my first animal. Um, I started with goats. Um, then we went to cows. When my grandpa passed away, Ray Archuleta, how many of you in here know Ray Archuleta? Okay. I'm working at the fire department full time and Ray Archuleta calls me one day in 2013 and he said, Russell, you've got to get cows. You've got to mob graze them like the buffaloes did on the plains. You need to pack them tight. You need to move them every day. You need to do all these things. 30 minutes later, Ray Archuleta took a breath where I could interject and I said, Ray, <laughs> I don't have any cows. Oh, you gotta buy them. <laughs> so we went to the cell barn and at 2013, it was like $2 a pound for that one crazy cow that everybody wanted to get rid of. And we bought 12 of them. <laughs> and they told me they were Springers, which I thought, you know, that meant they were gonna have calf in the springtime. What it was is every day I went to work my 24 shift, hour shift at the fire department, they would spring over the fence into the highway and then highway patrol would call me to come get my crazy cows. So we've had a lot of learning experiences, um, but you know, like they said earlier, I, I met this guy. I went to the soil water district the first year we were farming because we had winter weeds and we had winter erosion issues, even in no-till. And when I went to the soil water district, the NRCS office is right across the hallway and I'm talking to Randy at the soil and water and I was telling him about the problems and it was almost like a cover crop drug deal where like Lee pokes his head out the door and he was like, hey, can I tell you about cover crops in here? I promise you, they're, they're really good. Um, and so I went in Lee's office and he showed me this video. I don't know if you may, may uh, know who this younger gentleman is here on the screen now, um, but I watched a 30 minute video called Undercover Farmers. And I had farmers from North Carolina, the Dakotas, Ohio, uh, David Brandt, Jay was on there. Essentially it was farmers talking about using the processes that Lee had just told me about and it gave me the confidence that if farmers could do it where I was located, and if all of these farmers across the U.S. were able to do it in maybe different techniques, but the same principles, then I should be able to do the same thing. And so this is what North Carolina looks like typically in the fall. Um, we have a lot of tillage still. If you know what a 303D classification is, that's full sediment, um, top to bottom in our water pool. Um, our county is supposed to be no-till, but we still have three or three D classifications in our main river system. And this is one of the reasons. And this is what it looks like all winter. Um, they'll bed it up or they'll flatten it out and the water lays there all winter. And then it also carries off a lot of the nutrients 
which then flow into our water systems. If you haven't seen the Gulf hypoxic zone, that's what that is in the bottom. That's essentially where a lot of our runoff ends up and everything dies in that area of the Gulf. So where did we start? Um, how many of you have seen these massively tall six and seven foot tall cover crops in magazines and on TV and they look really awesome? And if you do that the very first year, if you've never done a cover crop before, you're probably not going to sleep much and you're probably not going to have great success. Um, start small and build your way up. Um, this picture right here, um, this was my first cover crop. This is in 2012 when I was a lot younger without gray hair. And uh, that's about where we terminated it, was about knee high. Um, we had never planted into a biomass like that. We didn't know how to deal with termination. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Now we've worked our way up to where we're getting into high biomass, but you don't have to start there. We also do nutrient analysis on our cover crops. Um, it used to be that we would go out in the field and we would cut two foot by three foot, a six, inch, a six square foot sample. We would pull two or three of those across the field. We would take them back and we would dry them on a trailer and then we would send them into the lab. Now NRCS has a protocol where you can actually put these in the oven and that's what my DC did. He took it home 350 degrees, put it in the oven. His wife almost divorced him for the smell so I don't typically recommend that way to do it. Um, if you have somebody else at home with you. But we, we were just simply looking at carbon to nitrogen ratio at that point in time. We didn't understand nutrient release from these cover crop mixes. So um, I'm gonna pick on y'all while I'm talking today. What's the, where are you from, in, in Minnesota? What's your average rainfall? Annual rainfall? 36. 36 inches. So what we have been seeing, and this doesn't matter east to west, north to south, it's your annual precipitation, and this has to do with nutrient release. If you have a 36 inch annual precept, if you want the maximum benefit from that cover crop as far as nutrients go, not weed suppression or erosion, but nutrients, you want it to be that annual rainfall to one on your carbon to nitrogen. So you would want a 36 to one. So essentially at a 36 to one, or for me, where I'm at, it's a 40 to one, I'm gonna see about 80% of the nitrogen from that cover crop residue. I'm gonna get about 75 to 80% of the potassium, the phosphorus, and about 75% of the micro and macro elements released out of that cover crop residue into my cash crop. And so start paying attention to these carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's not always about having this massively big cover crop because if you're in a drier environment, I know parts of Minnesota were dry this year. Say you only got 10 inches of rainfall this year on your farm and you had a 40 to one carbon to nitrogen ratio with 10 inches of rainfall, you probably didn't see hardly any nutrient release from that cover crop residue. You saw those nutrients locked up, which is actually gonna, you know, it's not gonna be beneficial to your cash crop if that's what you're growing. And this is the way that we do it. We do it with a, a nutrient analysis that we send to the lab. You can see for our cover crop this last year for this field, um, our C to N ratio was a 16.7. Look at the nitrogen though, 166 pounds of nitrogen in that cover crop residue. We're expecting 80% release from that. That's a massive amount of nitrogen that I don't have to apply as a farmer. We also look at potassium, phosphorus. You know, at potassium we were at uh, 232 pounds. That's a lot of potassium that's gonna be available for that cash crop. This one was ahead of corn. So if, if you're interested in how cover crops can actually release nutrients, Dr. Haney, Green Cover Seeds, and a few other people did studies. This is one of their studies. If you have low potassium and you plant surge spring triticale, it was the highest. It released 142 pounds of potassium to that year's crop. If you don't need a lot of potassium, you can also plant sun hemp. It was the worst. Um, Bersine clover was not the best, but these are examples of if you need potassium and they have nitrogen, potassium, CO2 increase for respiration. They have all of these things that are listed and publicly available where you can look and make cover crop recommendations based on your nutrient needs or your soil needs for your farm. So what is current testing? It's non-living, it's not integrated The extracts were developed anywhere from 1945 to 1984. Now this is what blows my mind as a first generation farmer. How many of you in here use an Olson test? I'm gonna make you work. So we have a few Olsons. How many use Bray? 
and how many use Melik? All right. The Olsen was developed in 1945. Bray was developed in the 60s, and Dr. Ol uh, Dr. Milik actually uh, developed the Milik 3 in North Carolina around 1984, 1985. Our soil testing protocols haven't changed since the rotary dial phone. I go to my tractor and have more intelligence in my pocket than they sent a man to the moon with, but yet we're still using extracts that haven't changed and haven't been updated for almost the last 60 to 80 years but yet we're basing our crop nutrient needs and how much money I spend on my farm on fertility off of something that hasn't changed in 60 to 80 years. I've been farming 11 years and the amount of technology change that we've had in just 11 short years is absolutely amazing to me. And so this is how the Olson was set up and how we looked at nitrogen management all the way back then is they said, let's apply 0, 50, 100, 150, and 200 pounds of nitrogen and they made a curve here and they said, hey, right here is optimal where the triangle is. And that is what I saw as a first generation farmer when I looked at going into farming. And then I met this guy named Dr. Rick Haney. And Rick Haney said, but wait, we all know that it takes one to 1.25 pounds of nitrogen to make a bushel of corn. I mean, everybody understands that. Well, if that's correct, how did we apply zero and make 120? This right here is what we should be focusing on and how we maximize this. And if you still want to use a little bit of fertilizer, use just a little bit to maximize on top of that. It's return on investment, not optimum. And so this is actually one that included Minnesota, so I put it in here for y'all. So this was their nitrogen recommendations and calculations on how yield correlated to the pounds of nitrogen. And essentially this looks like somebody got drunk at a field party and shot a barn with a shotgun and drew a line through it and said, hey, that's calibrated. <laughs> I would say moonshine because that's what we drink in the South, but I don't know what y'all drink at barn parties in Minnesota. Um, but that's horrible. Okay, so over here at zero, so we're at about 25 pounds. We had 50, 50 bushels, 100 bushels, up to about 150 bushels with 25 pounds of nitrogen. But how and why? And I'm not saying that fertilizer is bad. I use fertilizer on my farm every single year. But I also use tests where I can cut back 50 to 75 percent without you, you, you know, you losing yield. So this is our paradigm shift. Like I said, we're, we're trying to go from the rotary dial phone over here to a nice iPhone. So every year I pull a Millic 3. That's my state standard. That's what I've been using since 2011 when we first pulled our soil samples. We still pull Millic 3 so we can compare it to our other biological tests like the Haney test or PLFA. NC State, how many of you in here pull your own soil samples? Who got the soil sample probe earlier? Wasn't in the back. How deep do you pull your soil samples? Six inches? Are you, are you, I mean, are you minimum tillage, full-scale tillage? No-till? All right, six inches in no-till. Who's a tiller in here? Anybody do any tillage, recreational tillage? Come on, there's got to be one. <laughs> oh, y'all are shy today. Okay, well, we'll move on from that one. So NC State said in no-till that I needed to test from zero to four inches. Why? Because of nutrient stratification. They said nutrients wouldn't move through the soil. You can only go down to four inches. And then they said, well, if you till with a disc, you should go to six inches, and if you mold bore plow, we'll take it on down to eight. And so we got a Giddings probe that goes on the back of a tractor. They're about $45,000. And we started sampling all of our farms down to three feet. So what NC State said for zero to four in no-till, I had roughly 100 pounds of potassium in the zero to four. But in the four to eight, I had another 57 pounds. And in the eight to 12, I had another 46 pounds. I had more in four to eight and eight to 12 than I did in zero to four. Well, how can that be? Because Obviously, no-till has an issue with nutrient stratification. And then we looked at sulfur. In the top four inches, sulfur was 24 pounds, but four to eight was 51 pounds, and eight to 12 was 52 pounds. So we had a massive amount of sulfur just below that zero to four range, but yet they're saying that we don't need to sample that deep. Well, my corn plants grow deeper than a flower pot, and so we test all of our farms at a minimum 12 inches. Most year, we're going 18 inches deep. And there's a lot of fertility there. These are two inch increments that we ran on a Haney test. And we, you know, we're still seeing nutrients and we're seeing oxygen move down throughout the Haney test, looking at organic matter, 
organic nitrogen, phosphorus, and available phosphorus. I mean, do y'all see any reason? I mean, this is pretty much 100% throughout the profile that we're having available phosphorus. And it's something that Grant was talking about, and this is pretty cool to understand. One million earthworms will turn roughly about 40,000 pounds of soil a year. And our earthworm count, you'll see some pictures, um, we're running about three to 3.5 million earthworms in our one foot cubic samples. So that means our earthworms are turning almost 120,000 pounds a year. And so if you haven't seen a Haney test, this is what a Haney test looks like from the lab that I use. So we've got our soil respiration, which gives us our biological indicators. Our organic carbon is essentially the food source that they can consume. The percent MAC, imagine that as a checking account. That is how much carbon the microbes are using. So our microbes are consuming way more carbon than we actually have available in that soil. And what happens is if you see percent MAC over 100%, they'll actually start to break down soil organic matter. What I want y'all to see here real quick is this was taken in 2015 and we were at about 2.29% organic matter. That was in the top six. This is in the top six, we were at 7.5. I was told I couldn't raise organic matter 1% in my lifetime. I have farms that were over 6% increases now. I wish I would have known in the first years to sample deeper because we never did a 6 to 12 or 12 to 18. Here's my, here's my 6 to 12. 6 to 12 organic matter, 6.4%. Our percent MAC is still at 154%. These are just the biologicals that we can see how our farm is working. And then you've got your phosphorus, you've got your potassium, calcium, soil pHs. Um, you get a lot of the same a lot of the same information, but it's a different extraction. So Milik 3 Milik 3 uses an extractant that's kind of like hydrochloric acid. It's very acidic. If it rained Milik 3 extractant, we would all be dead today. It wouldn't happen. I mean, life would cease to exist. The Haney test uses water and three organic acids. Those three organic acids are to mimic the acids that the roots and the crops that we plant secrete into the soil and release those nutrients. So one is liquid death and one is water with three organic acids. Which one do you think is more like nature? It's the Haney test. Is the Haney test better always? No. There are things that change, like if you're a 7.1, 7.2 pH or higher, there are things that they have to change on the Haney test and they need to know that pH change because of the way the extractant works. Um, if you're in a drought, if you farm river bottoms, so we have a few river bottoms we farm. If you have a river bottom that's been flooded and it's been anaerobic for a long time, you're probably not gonna see a lot of this biological activity and you're not gonna see some of this cycling that they, they look for in that biological activity. And so those are things you have to take into consideration. So if you have low soil biology, this is another part of that test that Haney did. What's something we can do? Well, Egyptian wheat, popcorn, WS or WGS, faba beans, sedan grass, these right here show the highest increases in biological activity for cover crops. So if you pull a test and you don't see a lot of activity and a lot of cycling, these are just things that you can use to help further that process along. And so what have we seen on our farm? So we started mapping Haney test in 2013 and to the spring of 2022, our CO2 uh, respiration has increased 720%. Weoc is that organic carbon, that's their food source. We've seen it increase 590%. And the biggest thing for us was the organic, organic matter change. So on the right up here, I saw some really nice black dirt that had been turned over. And I wish I could take some of it back home in dump trucks and spread it over my field because it would be great. But this is what we start with. Low organic matter, high iron content, red orange clay, it's, it's tough. It's tough to farm in that situation. We have to remediate a lot of the soil. But just in four years, this is a spade sample that's 16 inches deep. And down to that eight inch level, you can see the change from orange to more brown. And you, we're starting to see earthworms starting to come into these farms. And then in 2022, this is what our ground looked like. That's the same farm. It went from an orange, lifeless, just crusted material 
to now we have aggregation. We have carbon in the soil. It looks like chocolate cake. When it rains, the, the soil absorbs that rain and stores it for the crop. So Archuleta came out to the farm. Um, you saw Lance with the infiltration ring. This is ours. Um, we just used some auger pipe that we had left over. Um, we were doing an earthworm count. We were at 93 to 98 earthworms per cubic foot. And that comes up to about 3.3 million per acre in the top foot. But Gabe Brown likes to talk to you about cocktails. David Brandt would always love to tell you about his radishes. I want to tell you about my corn. Mark asked me to put a picture of my corn up today for y'all. So. so where do we start at? Um, we use a lot of data and a lot of technology. Um, these are sensors. These probes go in the ground 48 inches, and every four inches we're measuring root depth, monitoring our EC, our electric conductivity for nutrient removal, timing of water needs, and soil temps. It's pretty neat. They're cheap. I think we spent 1500 bucks the first year for these sensors, and then I think every year they're only costing us about $500 for the data management. But without cover crops, we have a natural hard pan where I live at North Carolina that's about 18 inches deep. And when it rained, you'll see these probes coming up, they're about 15 feet apart. It hit that 20 inch level and the water quit infiltrating. Where we had cover crops, we had moisture that was getting down to 40 inches. That's double the depth and profile that we're moving that water down and storing it for later in the season. In North Carolina, we're usually 10 days away from a drought. That's the famous saying in our state. These are the sensors. You can see the one we had in cover crops. You can see the one that was in our uh, no cover crop strip. The biggest thing I want you to take away is each one of these blue vertical lines is a rainfall event. We had all of these rainfall events with cover crops and where we didn't have cover crops, what happened? Our soil temperatures can get over 110 degrees in the summertime where we have bare ground. Even if it's not tilled, even in just standard no-till, if, if a, a farmer at home doesn't plant cover crops in a no-till situation, they'll burn off their purple dead nettle in their hen bit and they'll plant their corn crop and by about V4 that stuff's gone and it's bare red ground and those temperatures will hit 100 plus degrees. And that ground will actually seal off. And if we just get light rain showers like we saw here, they'll infiltrate where we have the ground covered and it doesn't crust over. Where it's bare and it gets hot, it actually crusts over. That, that water sits on top of the ground and evaporates before it goes in for the crop, which amazed me that we were able to pick some of this stuff up. But then we look at root activity. Where we had cover crops, most of our root activity was between four to 44 inches in depth. Where we didn't use cover crops, even in no-till, most of our root activity was between four to 16 inches. It hit that hard pan, and then we weren't able to go any deeper than that. Then we map our EC, and we actually look at how we're feeding this crop. Where we had cover crops, our readings were the biggest between 12 to 16 inches in the season. As it progressed, we fed the crop through the top 16 inches. No cover crops, we were limited to the top eight inches. Imagine double the depth and profile to feed that crop. So what our comparison is, is how many of you are dry land? Just no irrigation at all. I'm gonna pick on you. Hey, how much would you pay for an extra seven to nine inches of moisture a year? Depends on can you, the year. This year a lot. Yeah, <laughs> but can you put a number on having that additional moisture that was either conserved, stored, or put in the ground for that crop? Because I had a dry season this year and I'm glad I had that extra seven to nine inches. It paid off big time for us. But that's what we were seeing. We had seven to nine inches more moisture where we were using soil health principles and, re and, and doing regenerative practices with cover crops than without it. And this is what some of our corn crops have looked like. Um, I'll tell you a real funny story. How many of you have seen mushrooms in your field? So I had a neighbor farmer call me one day and he was like, hey man, we were riding down past your farm and we saw mushrooms out in the field. I was like, oh, okay. He's like, you gotta get out there and spray them. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, it's a fungus, you gotta go spray those things. And I was like, well, what are they doing? Walking out there with knives, cutting the corn down? Like I've never seen a mushroom move before, but maybe this is a new species. And he was like, no, but that fungus, we didn't spray them, but it's always interesting calls from the neighbors. Another thing you can do is if you plant cover crops and you let them get big enough and you roll them down in the springtime, Ray Archuleta will sprout out of them and, and, <laughs> and help you out with information. I always joke about Ray on that slide. Um, 
but it's, it's truthful. The amount of field days that we've had, um, the amount of people we've, been, we've had the benefit of coming to the farm, um, you can see, I mean, we, we left a walkway here for people to come for the field day, but look at that ground cover. Um, we keep our ground covered 365 days a year the best we can. Um, and, and one of the things that have really showed is this is the same corn variety planted on the same day, the same planter pass. Um, we didn't change up our fertility program. But on the right-hand side of the screen, it had a, a seven-way cover crop mix and livestock integration. And on the left-hand side of the screen, it was no-till with no cover crops, no livestock, no regenerative practices. Um, this is our standard farming where I'm from. This is what we've been taught over the last 10 years to do. And that's the difference. When we started integrating cover crops, looking at nutrient cycling, looking at PLFA tests to see where our biology is and balance those fungal to bacteria ratios, that's when we started seeing corn 60, 62, 64 pound test weights. Um, that's when we saw yields start to go up and, they, and they've done it incrementally over the last 10 years. But this is what we're shooting for now. This is what we would have been growing had we not done these practices. And so we do a lot of nitrogen tests on the farm. Um, I'll make it pretty quick for you. This received the full recommended rate of nitrogen um, that the University of North Carolina called for. They called for 250 units of nitrogen per acre. So we applied 250 here. And then Rick Haney said, well, based on the Haney test, you really don't need a lot. How about cut it in half and then do none? And so we did 125 on this one and we did zero nitrogen applied on that one. This one right here was strictly supplied from soil biology and cover crops. Can anybody guess, I mean, just take a wild guess what the yield difference is from 250 down to no nitrogen at all. Anybody? 5%. 5%, that's actually pretty close. It was nine bushels. So from full nitrogen to no nitrogen at all, we lost nine bushels. That's $105 an acre difference in nitrogen. So we saved $105 an acre in nitrogen. We lost about $36 in yield. Now, when we wanna push for yield and we have ground that has high organic matter, high cycling, and we have a piece of ground that can sustain those higher yields, um, we don't go out there and apply no nitrogen at all. But we do have some farms that the ground is pretty bad. Um, we're remediating it. It's meant to grow maybe 150 to 200 bushel corn and it doesn't receive a bunch of inputs and a bunch of nitrogen. And we do, you know, we start looking at these trials of what are we gonna to do to increase return on investment? Um, this is what our, our high yielding corn look like. Um, I don't know if y'all can tell, but here's my hip and down here's my knee. And we had some of the biggest corn ears that I've ever had in my life. The corn plants did great that year. We had really good moisture. Here's some of our stalks. That's a 1995 quarter, if you can't see it very well. This is a video. This is the first time that we've ever had corn that weighed over one pound per year. When we started doing compost teas, foliar sprays, um, we're doing nitrogen management where we're not super loading that corn. Um, how many of you in here apply anhydrous? Anybody do anhydrous up here? Man, not a lot, I thought it'd be more than that. So if you go out and put all your nitrogen out in the springtime, that corn plant can be forced to grow faster than it wants to especially if you get bad weather conditions. Um, you can push a corn plant a little bit too, too fast, too hard. One of the things that we started looking at was mapping out nutrient needs throughout the entire growing season. And one of the things that was kind of crazy to me is say V6, which we're roughly about four weeks in the season, we've only used 14 pounds of potassium. But just two more weeks, three more weeks later, when we get to V10, we went from 14 pounds of potassium to 165 pounds of potassium. That's absolutely crazy to see that potassium uptake in those plants go up that fast. And Myron asked me to do it, so there it is. This is our full program um, on our high yield corn. This is everything that we made, every pass that we made. Um, it's got our burn down. It's got our post uh, spray that we did at V6. We didn't spray insecticides. Um, we did have some gray leaf spot come in that year and we sprayed a fungicide. We used Valtima with a drone. We typically 
don't spray a lot of fungicides on the farm. Um, we scout, if we see it, we use it, but it's very sparingly. Um, we had 180 pound uh, nitrogen credit that we took from our soil sample on the Haney test. We had 125 pound nitrogen credit that we took from our cover crop test. Um, our pop-up was three gallons of Inferomax, um, fulvic acids, bore, uh, bore shot, which is a boron product, sugar and algae. Our two by two, uh, we had some micros and macros. We did a Y drop. Um, weren't we talking at breakfast about the uh, liquid urea? So that's the Aussie sauce. Um, the Aussie sauce is the liquefied urea. It's got humates, um, a 90020S. Uh, the molasses, the compost tea, and the nickel sulfate. So that's what we've been using from Rabo in Australia. Um, at V8, V9, we did a top dress with nitrogen again. Uh, we went over the top with a urea AMS mix. But what I, what I want y'all to pay attention to is I'm telling you a lot about passes, but that's 30 pounds of nitrogen. That's not a lot of nitrogen for a pass. It's not like we're going on here and putting 100, 200 pounds of nitrogen on. We're making a lot of passes over these crops, but we're spoon feeding it as it needs it. It's not that we're front loading a lot of nitrogen. A wide drop pass we did at Tassel, once again, it was 30 pounds of nitrogen. And then with the uh, drone, we did a foliar with sugar. Um, there's a product called uh, soy sauce and Tassel shot, and then CM mix is just a, a bunch of micros and macros of fulvic acid. That nickel sulfate, if you haven't used any nickel sulfate on your farm, it's one to two grams an acre, and it makes a massive different, uh, difference in plant health. Um, one of the things me and Myron have talked about is there is a lot of universities that are studying and private laboratories studying tar spot. Um, if you're having tar spot issues, pull a tissue sample and have them test it for the nickel level. Um, this last year, over 50% of the fields that had the heaviest um, tar spot infestations that we were seeing tested super low and deficient on the nickel. And if they were having to spray a fungicide for tar spot, just putting in a gram to two grams of nickel sulfate actually helped that plant with that tar spot. And I would be interested to know how that would work up here in Minnesota. Most of the stuff I've seen has been in the I states or Michigan. But here's our grain economics. Um, our best dry land yield was 459.51 bushels. That was recorded and weighed. Our cost per acre was $1,008. Uh, Grant, you were asking about the economics on it. Um, our cost per bushel was roughly $2.19 a bushel. So we made just a little hair over $3,000 an acre net was our return on that. And I know a lot of people say that if you're pushing ground and you're trying to yield, most of these guys aren't making money. I don't know what the other guys are doing, but there's our full economics from those sheets that you just saw. If y'all have any questions, feel free to ask them as well. I'm trying to stay on time so we got time. Um, if you like the content um, and you like to hear more about how we're doing our testing, actually seeing them in the field, um, this year we're on, a, we're on a TV show called Top Crop that's going to air on RFD TV and Acres TV starting in January. You can look that one up as well. And the biggest thing I'll say is agronomy still matters even with healthy soils. Um, we didn't have to pro spray about 480 acres of corn this year with herbicide. Um, we didn't post spray about 390 acres of beans. Our chemical savings on that alone was about $28,000. That's way more than my cover crop. Just in chemical savings, that's more than my cover crop cost me. So we got that return back just in that. But then we look at our Haney test reductions. Uh, phosphorus, we saved 34,000. Potassium, 8,000. Nitrogen, we saved just over $92,000. Our total savings on the farm with chemical reductions and the Haney test was $164,000. Now, when Heather hears about that, she's like, hey, that's enough money. You can take me on a really nice vacation this winter to somewhere warm and hot. And I'm like, well, that'll also buy me a new tractor that I want. So it's kind of a give or take on, on where that might end up at this year. Um, how many of you apply nitrogen stabilizers? Come on. Do you know what kind you use? Anybody know what kind of nitrogen stabilizers they use? Instinct. Instinct. I don't think I've... Do you know what, do you know if that's a DCD? Uh, it's a nitropyrene, okay. Anybody in here from Nutrien? All right, good. Um, I'm not gonna pick on them. All I'm gonna say is this, Nutrien sells a product called Nitrain, and we used it for a couple years. And what Nutrien says 
that it does, they're, they're correct. It does work. The problem is, is that it's a DCD. And a DCD gets washed off of the nitrogen, it goes in the ground, and it actually kills the bacteria. So how does nitrogen convert in the ground? By bacteria. That's a lot of the association. So if we kill them, what does that do to my nitrogen cycle? It stops it. Well, I met a woman named Carolyn Wingate who owns Wind Biologics. I don't mind putting it up here because she's pretty smart. And I was using a DCD. And we were having issues that we could apply nitrogen with a DCD. We would have nitrogen have a yellow flash. And then about two to three weeks later, it would be really nice and green. What that was is, is we had killed the bacteria and it took two to three weeks for them to build back, start the nitrogen cycle again. But during that two to three week period, what was going on with my corn crop? It was suffering because it didn't have adequate nitrogen. And the product works. It did what they said it was supposed to, but it's not what I need. So we started looking at MBPTs. So MBPTs essentially are a calcium particle that's positively charged. It gives a docking station for negatively charged nitrogen. It biodegrades in sunlight and the water also biodegrades it and it helps move it and slow release that nitrogen. Another one is polymers. Um, if you know what ESN is, Nutrient also sells ESN, we've used it before, that is a polymer. They essentially encapsulate it and it breaks down over time. Polymers do work good too, but you have to apply them early in the season. But the things that we don't want to use are DCDs and nitropyrenes because we can actually set the soil back as far as biological goes and we can actually stop that nitrogen conversion, which is great for saving the nitrogen, but it doesn't help cycle it and make it available to the crop. So those are things we have to think about as producers. Um, we talked a little bit at breakfast at our table about balancing the nitrogen to carbon ratio. Soil biology has a carbon to nitrogen ratio. If we throw tons of nitrogen at it at any given point in large quantities, we can offset that C to N ratio. Um, what we have begun doing is we treat all of our nitrogen with humix or fulvix, and we're trying to balance the nitrogen with a carbon source when we're putting it out. This right here, um, last year and this year, our two-year study is showing about an eight to 10 bushel increase with one quart of humix, one to one and a half quarts. Putting that on, treating that, or putting it in with our 28%. Check strips. Um, one of the biggest things that have been a, a critical success for us on our farm is my DC got me to do a check strip when we first started. And so we've left a check strip here with some really nice purple uh, dead nettle and hem bit. We had cover crops on either side. We came in, we planted our beans through that residue. And here's the check strip again. It's the only place that we had massive amounts of weeds. We've got Palmer, Johnson grass, Cucklebur, pigweed, a whole list of weeds that we're able to essentially suppress just by keeping that ground covered with those, with those cover crops. And then we'll talk a little bit about beans. Um, how many of you in here know critical daylight? Has anybody heard that in bean production? Um, if you haven't heard about critical daylight, I would really recommend that you look that up. It's really great information on how you can change up some of your day lengths in your soybean varieties to match up with your weather pattern of when we're going into reproduction and pod set. When we started paying attention to critical daylight, we're using regenerative practices, we're conserving moisture. That's the hood of my pickup truck. That's how big our bean plants are now. They're massive. We're stacking nodes typically within a one inch area. Um, we're not throwing tons of nitrogen at it with having a lot of people have told me if you put a cover crop with legumes in it ahead of beans that they wouldn't nodulate. That's incorrect. Beans won't nodulate if you put out synthetic forms of nitrogen and they've got all that free nitrogen in that form. But if you can put vetch, crimson clover, winter peas, I've put everything in front of these beans and they still get massive nodules that we've actually seen nitrogen production still in these beans. And if you're gonna grow more than a 50 bushel bean crop, to 60 bushels, those beans, everybody says, well, beans make their own nitrogen. They're gonna make probably enough nitrogen for 50 to 60 bushels. If you're gonna to try to push over that, it's either gotta come from the soil, organic matter, whatever it may be. But you can see our stack nodes, we're trying to keep these nodes as tight as we can. Um, we try to do as much branching. This was a picture of, of one of our uh, beans that was taken on July the 19th. 
This was on August the 1st in the same field. We were up to 51 nodes. And this was taken on August the 19th. This is, I mean, it's a little shriveled up, but I kept it. But that's out of the same field, and that's what we're seeing. Where we're using cover crops and we're keeping moisture in the ground, where we're doing small foliar passes that cost us very minimal amounts, um, small amounts of some PGRs. So when we started looking at it, this is our soybean tree field. Um, the state came out, uh, we did our yield contest, and these beans ended up at 117.1 bushels dry land. Um, a lot of this has to do with nutrient cycling. Corn will respond to fertility, beans, res corn will respond to fertilizer, beans respond to fertility. And by having these cover crops and this, this nutrient cycling um, has really helped us with, with increasing those beans and bean size. And we talked a little bit about it, and if you've never heard this before, does anybody in here besides who was at dinner last night know what the number one nutrient need is for soybeans from R4 to R6, the number one nutrient? Any guesses? Zinc. It's zinc. Right up here. This silver line right here, we're showing a dip right before R4, and then from R4 to R6, zinc is the highest needed nutrient. Zinc is a chemical signal that'll tell a soybean plant to take all of its nutrients and as much as it can from the plant and put it into the seed. So if you've ever wondered why some years you may have 3,000 seeds per pound on beans and say two years later in a rotation you plant beans on that farm again and it may go up to 2,500 seeds per pound which is a lot bigger and helps increase yield, it could be something as simple as zinc. If you are deficient on zinc from R4 to R6, that plant will not maximize the uptake of nutrients into that soybean for filling um, your beans up. And this is the difference. So our normal management practice, we were at 2,841 seeds per pound. I would say that's fairly average across the board. Then where we're looking at deep injection, we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow in some of our equipment. We, were got, we got down to 1,736 seeds per pound. Now this is the same variety in the same field. These are five acre plots that we've been working on. And we were down to 1,736, where we integrated our foliar program in our beans and we balanced those nutrients with tissues. That's a dime. So just understand that these beans were the size of pentos. They were 1,359 seeds per pound. To go from here to here with no added plants, no change in variety, that's doubling the yield. Where we're looking at our nutrient management with cover crops and foliars, that's doubling the yield just from here to here. And so our last slide we're gonna talk about is, I don't like university plots because they're 20 feet wide and 200 feet long and that doesn't take into a lot of the same considerations I have on my farm. So we do five acre blocks. This is a 25 acre field. This is the Haney test. We put Millic 3 right beside of it. Haney test, Millic 3, and down here was a Haney test, but with our program, our foliar program and our injection program. So here we have a Haney test soybean and we have a Millic 3. These are roughly about 60 inches apart. Dr. Haney came out in September he was holding the Haney beans and the Millic 3 beans and we were looking out here in the plot to see what our yields were going to be to try to get an estimate. And so based on 1285 beans, which is probably average for what most farmers could have got this year, the Millic 3 plot called for 22 pounds of nitrogen, 60p, 60k, 9 sulfur, and a quarter pound of boron. So we applied MAP, AMS, potash, and granny bore. It made 37.56 bushels. That's relatively close to what our county average is. Where we did the Haney test, the Haney test actually called for more phosphorus. And this is probably the most controversial thing I think I put on my social media this year with a lot of soil scientists absolutely going back crazy over it. Because everybody said, well, the Haney test should call for less, less fertilizer. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's in different forms. So the Haney test called for 10 more pounds of phosphorus, half the amount of potassium, two pounds less sulfur, 
but we applied a quarter pound more boron. So in the grand scheme of things, we applied 47 pounds less fertilizer to the acre. But because we applied more phosphorus, and it is the most expensive nutrient that we use, it cost us $11 more an acre with the Haney test. Over the Haney test, the Haney plot did 52.47 bushels to the acre. So it made 15 more, more bushels to the acre. And even though we spent $11 more an acre in fertility, we made $180 more per acre where we utilized the Haney test. Then where we had our other foliar programs, our pass at V4, here was our pass at R3. These are just foliars, molybdenum. Um, we've been using a PGR and trialing it out. Um, the Haney plus our foliar program was 86.43 bushels with, the, with weight and scale. And so the return on investment over the Millic 3 where we did the Haney test and our foliar program was an extra $558 an acre net. Not gross, net, profit.